The scripture this morning is from <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 18 and 22 through 24. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthian, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet, prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit among all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall, see, shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Thank you. Nancy, I believe, wins the prize for the toughest reading of the year. That was the day that the Spirit came. The day that the Spirit was promised by Jesus came during the Last Supper, the night before he died. And Jesus made this promise. He spoke these words to his disciples at the Last Supper. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer, about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Here ends our reading from John chapter uh, 15 and 16. I used to love to go scuba diving. 
Uh, and I especially liked to scuba dive with sharks. Then I got married, and Katie has made me promise that I will never do such things again. Uh, that's me, actually. I'm the one in the background uh, with the, uh, the yellow mask there. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was actually, you know, when I lived in Central America and I lived right on the, uh, the coast, it was uh, a much easier thing to do. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, you know, now, now that I live near Lake Erie, there isn't, frankly, a lot of good scuba diving to be done there in Lake Erie that I've seen, especially not compared to stuff like that. Um, I enjoyed going to Honduras to a place that was known for its abundance of sharks. Now, I know that a lot of folks think that sharks are something you want to avoid when you're scuba diving, but uh, it's not, not the case. They're beautiful, fascinating creatures, and I really enjoyed uh, going down to, to see them. Now, there was this uh, place uh, on, the, on, on the north side of a certain island in Honduras that I liked to go to um, that had sh a lot of sharks. And as I was going there once uh, with uh, uh, some friends to do this specific shark dive, uh, we got into a boat. It was like, you know, one of those Zodiac boats that you may have seen on Jacques Cousteau. You know, it's kind of an inflatable motorboat. Uh, and we realized in this boat that we had uh, two preachers, two doctors, and two lawyers in a boat about to jump into shark-infested waters. And uh, it occurred to us that we had the beginnings of a really good joke. We just we didn't know how it was going to end, you know, what the punchline was going to be. Uh, I, the lawyers actually came up with the, the best punchline. They said that the sharks ate the doctors first and then the preachers, but they left the lawyers as a professional courtesy. Uh, <laughs> How is it that such an honorable profession as lawyers got to be so maligned, you know? Uh, everybody knows a good lawyer joke or two. I just happened to be living one at that moment. <laughs> um, but I, I think that our perception of uh, lawyers affects even our translation of the scriptures. Because perhaps if it weren't for that, our Bible translation, and when Jesus promises to send us this advocate, um, we really could well translate that as lawyer, that Jesus promises to send us a lawyer, but he doesn't do that, does he? <laughs> that word advocate uh, it comes from a particular Greek text, and I want to go back and, and, and review where, where I read that in the scriptures today. In verse 26, chapter 15, when the advocate comes, Jesus says, whom I will send to you from the Father. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. Again, in John chapter 16, verse 7, I tell you the truth, uh, it is to your advantage that I go, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. All right? And then again, in um, John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. Now this is a promise that is very powerful. This is the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And in our Bible translation, it says this word advocate. Advocate, it says repeatedly. And advocate is actually a translation of a Greek word which is parakletos. Parakletos. But translating that word can be kind of tricky, all right? The Greek word parakletos is as difficult to translate as it is critical to our understanding of what Jesus is getting at here. At its most literal meaning, this word advocate, parakletos in Greek, means one called alongside. But you can detect the trouble that they've had translating this in the many different ways that parakletos is, is rendered in, in different Bible translations. In our NRSV translation and in the NAB translation, it's rendered as advocate. Uh, but uh, in other translations, it is called uh, comforter. 
in the NIV, that's the King James translation, in the NIV translation, parakletos is translated as counselor. In other translations, uh, they, the word parakletos is rendered as consoler or protector or helper or encourager. The Jerusalem Bible avoids the conundrum altogether uh, by simply saying, uh, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will send you another paraclete, whatever that is, <laughs> okay? Uh, so they basically say, we give up and we're not going to translate it. So you're just stuck with, with paraclete. But there is no translation that I've seen in which Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will send you another lawyer. But in fact, that would be a good translation, I just think that when the Bible translators were there in the dusty room figuring out how do we translate this Greek word parakletos and they wrote down, I will ask the Father and he will send you another lawyer. No, nah, they said, uh, that just doesn't sound right. There's something not good about that. But in fact, your parakletos was the one who would stand with you before the judge. He would answer on your behalf. He would give you advice and counsel. He would be your advocate. Um, I guess they just didn't want to have Jesus promising to send us any more lawyers. That just didn't seem like a good idea. Two schoolboys were talking to each other one day, and the one says, uh, my dad's a lawyer. And the other one said, huh, my dad is a lawyer too. Really? Honest, the other boy said? No, he said, it was just the regular kind. <laughs> but you know, a lawyer would be a good translation for this text because your parakletos was the one who would stand before the judge with you to answer on your behalf, to be your counsel, to be your guide. This is the promised spirit that comes from Jesus. This is the way Jesus expresses his a promise that, that, that the Spirit would come to us, our advocate, our counselor. And then, so when Paul in, in Romans chapter 28 says that the Spirit speaks with our spirit, the Spirit itself with our spirit gives witness. There is this tremendous spiritual energy and synergy that is taking place. And like Peter we experience a boldness like we'd never felt before when he stands up to announce that Jesus was crucified by those same people and yet God raised him from the dead. He would not be silent anymore. He was bold and courageous on that day of Pentecost. The way that the Spirit was manifest on that day of Pentecost there in Jerusalem tells us a lot about the power of the Spirit because there was tremendous diversity, right? And yet there was unity. There was multicultural diversity. They had come from all over the place, as, uh, as we heard in that first reading. There was also a multiplicity of languages. There was linguistic diversity. And yet all of them understood as one people. To be a church of Pentecost means that we experience that unity in our diversity. It means that we feel that fire of love, that we are burned by the fire of love, that our faith is not merely this stodgy kind of academic, heady experience, but that our hearts are set on fire. It is that experience of opening the windows and feeling that fresh breeze, opening the windows of your heart, opening the windows of the church, that we might experience the Spirit, breath, wind, Spirit, blowing through us in new ways that challenge us to growth. That's what Pentecost meant for them. It meant change, a wind of change that was blowing through the church and giving birth and new life to the church. And that's what it means for us as well. And I pray on this day of Pentecost that we can open the windows of our own soul, open the windows of our faith community, our church, to hear God's still speaking voice breathe new life into us and set that fire in our hearts and in our community. You know what the seven most famous last words of a church are? They are, but we've always done it this way. <laughs> right? 
And yes, we want to honor the tradition that has been handed on to us by our predecessors, by our ancestors. And yet, what those disciples did was to hear God's still speaking voice move them in new ways and new directions. And to feel the Spirit blowing them and breathing new life. And that meant change in their community. And our faith tradition links us to a rich and a beautiful past but to maintain that link is to allow God's voice to still speak in a dynamic and a relevant and a compassionate and an authentic way in our culture, in new circumstances, in a rapidly changing and increasingly connected world. God is still speaking. That spirit, that wind, is still blowing fresh air. Tony Campolo in his wonderful book, which is entitled The Kingdom of God is a Party, uh, tells a story that illustrates how the church has to live out the compassion and the spirit of God in new ways. Tony Campolo was attending a Christian conference in Honolulu. And, and I might mention, by the way, that if you ever feel moved to send me to a Christian conference in Honolulu, that, that would be okay. I mean, I'm just saying. Uh, so, so there he is. Because of the time change, he wakes up at 3 in the morning. He can't sleep. Eventually, he got dr dressed, left the hotel, went, and he found a donut shop. And here is his description of what happened there. He writes, the fat guy behind the counter came over and asked me what I wanted, and I told him I wanted a cup of coffee and a donut. As I sat there munching my donut and sipping my coffee at 3.30 in the morning, the door suddenly opened, swung wide, and to my discomfort, in marched eight or nine provocatively dressed and rather boisterous ladies of the night. It was a small place, and they sat on either side of me, their talk was garrulous, loud, and crude. I felt completely out of place and very awkward. I was just about to make my getaway when I heard the woman next to me say, you know, tomorrow's my birthday, I'm going to be 39. Her friend responded in a rather nasty tone. So what do you want from me? A birthday party? What do you want? You want me to get you a cake, sing happy birthday to you? Oh, come on, the woman next to me said. Why you got to be so mean? I'm just telling you that it's my birthday. Why do you have to put me down? I don't want anything from you. I mean, why should I have a birthday party? I never had a birthday party in my whole life. Why should I want one now? Camp Campolo says, when I heard that, I made a decision. I sat and waited until the women left. And then I called over to the fat guy behind the counter and I asked him, do they come in here every night? Yeah, he answered. The one who was sitting right next to me, does she come in every night? Yeah, he said, that's Agnes. Agnes comes in here every night. Why you want to know? Well, because, I replied, I heard her say that tomorrow is her birthday. What do you say we do something special for her? What do you think about throwing a birthday party for her right here in the coffee shop? A cute kind of a smile crept over that fat man's chubby cheeks. That's a great idea, he said. I like it. That's great. Agnes is one of those people who's really nice and kind. I don't think anybody's ever done anything nice and kind for her. Well, look, I told him, if it's okay with you, I'll be back here tomorrow morning at 2.30. I'll decorate the place. I'll even get a birthday cake for her. No way, he replied. The birthday cake, that's my thing. I'll bake the birthday cake myself. At 2.30 the next morning, Campolo says, I was back in that coffee shop. I picked up some crepe paper and other decorations at the store. And I made a big uh, sign of uh, pieces of cardboard that said, Happy Birthday, Agnes. I decorated that diner from one end to the other. I had it looking really great. Now, the word must have gotten out on the street because by 3.15 that morning, every prostitute in Honolulu was in that place. <laughs> there was wall-to-wall -wall prostitutes and me. <laughs> At 3.30, on the dot, the door of the diner swung open and in came Agnes and her friend. 
I had everybody ready. When they came in, we all jumped up and shouted, Happy birthday, Agnes. And then we sang to her. And you know, I've never seen a person so flabbergasted, so stunned, so shaken. Her mouth fell open, her knees started to buckle, her friend had to offer her arm to steady her, and I noticed that she had started to cry. And when the birthday cake with all the candles was carried out, that's when she lost it. She started sobbing. Harry, the fat guy behind the counter, gruffly mumbled, Blow out the candles, Agnes, blow out the candles. And then he handed her a knife and said, Cut the cake, Agnes, cut the cake. Agnes looked down at that cake, and without taking her eyes off of it, she slowly and softly said, Look, Harry, is it okay with you if, I mean, if I don't? What I want to ask is, is it okay if I keep the cake for a little while? Is it okay if we, if we don't cut it right away? Harry shrugged and answered, Well, sure, Agnes, that's fine. You want to keep the cake, you keep the cake. Take it home if you want to. Oh, could I? She asked. And looking at me, she said, I live just down the street a couple of doors. I want to take the cake home, okay? I'll be right back, honest. She got off her stool and picked up that cake and she carried it out of the diner like it was the Holy Grail. She walked slowly toward the door and we all just stood there speechless. And when the door closed behind her, there was a stunned silence in that place. Not knowing what else to do, I broke the silence by saying, what do you say we pray together? Now, looking back on it now, it seems a more than a little strange that a sociologist from eastern Pennsylvania would be leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes at a diner in Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning. But I prayed. I prayed for Agnes, and I prayed for her salvation. I prayed that her life would be good, that God would be good to her. And when I finished, Harry leaned over, and with a trace of hostility in his voice, he said, Hey, you never told me you were a preacher. What kind of a preacher are you anyway? What church do you belong to? And in one of those moments, when just the right words come, I answered him quickly and quietly. I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> Harry thought for a minute and then almost sneered as he answered, no, you don't. There's no church like that. In fact, he concluded, if there was, I'd join it. If there was, I would join it. Maybe Harry was right. Maybe there is no church that is open enough to the movement of the Holy Spirit to be that kind of a church. But if the church is to continue to provide a witness to the world about the unconditional and powerful love of God in the next millennium and beyond, that is the kind of a church we're going to have to become.